Christian friends, let us come before God in prayer. Gracious God, once again we come before your sacred word, ever assured that by the power of your spirit, your words will take on new form than simply those of marks on a page. Your word will take on form in us, in our hearts and our souls, to be true life, the life of the living word in your Son, Jesus Christ, abiding in us, that we may have the same heart and mind that was in Jesus Christ. Speak to us your word beyond this sacred page, that we may be empowered by your spirit to live your word in person, to live your word in the lives of those whom we encounter, that all might know your grace, that all might know your compassion, that all might know that you so love the world that you sent to us your Son, Jesus Christ. May we all believe in him, and in believing, may our lives be transformed to make this broken place a better world that reflects the coming of your kingdom. This we pray in Christ's most holy name. Amen. Our scripture lection for this morning comes from the Gospel according to St. Mark, chapter 8, verses 27 through 38. This passage in, and, and forgive me, I get excited about this one because this, is, if I don't already for other passages of scripture, but this is the transition point in Mark's Gospel. If, uh, if there is a single point where the theme, the, the major theme changes in Mark's Gospel, this is it, right here. The first half of Mark's Gospel, he has been focusing on that motif you keep hearing me talk about, the Messianic secret, in which Jesus comes into the world, and in so doing, he is, he as the Son of God, is uh, taking on the position of, of, of being the suffering servant for the sins of the world. But because that role as Messiah is misunderstood by the people who were expecting a regal Messiah or an apocalyptic Messiah, not a suffering Messiah, Jesus keeps his identity a secret and calls for people to keep it a secret. Finally, here in this passage, we see Jesus asking the disciples who people say he is and who they say he is. At which point, once they recognize Jesus as the Christ, Jesus makes his first, his first of three passion predictions where in, in Mark's gospel, where he will then be telling the disciples that this is what the Messiah must do. We'll see that the second half of the gospel is then focused on Jesus, on his way to Jerusalem, on his way to now, not so the, the Messianic secret motif will continue, but it will be uh, um, auxiliary. It will be a, a, less, a, a less concern. The primary concern is on Jesus, the suffering Son of God, the suffering servant for the sins of the world. All that takes place in this transition point, right here where Peter, on behalf of the disciples, makes the great confession as to who Jesus is. Listen for the word of God. Jesus went on with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi. And on the way, he asked his disciples, Who do people say that I am? And they answered him, John the Baptist, and others, Elijah, and still others, one of the prophets. He asked them, but who do you say that I am? Peter answered him, You are the Messiah. And he sternly ordered them not to tell anybody or anyone about him. Then he began to teach them that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders and chief priests and the scribes, and be killed, and after three days rise again. He said all this quite openly. 
And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and looking at his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. He called the crowd with his disciples and said to them, If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. For what will it profit them to gain the whole world and forfeit their life? Indeed, what can, what can they give in return for their life? If anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of them when he comes in his Father's glory with the holy angels. Amen, and may God give us to understand this reading of his holy word. This is the word of the Lord. It's a powerful passage, my Christian friends, because uh, for those of us, uh, and I'm hoping in your case too, for those of us who are students of the Gospels, uh, in Mark's Gospel, this is the transition point. Jesus, up until this point, has been uh, uh, doing his public ministry, but he's been keeping uh, his identity as the Messiah a secret simply because he knows people will misunderstand the role of the Messiah. Now... Now that he boldly asks his disciples, having been with them all this time, who do you say that I am? Peter, as the spokesperson for the disciples, say, you are the Christ, you are the Messiah. Jesus then begins to tell them, very good, now let me tell you what the Messiah must do. You, you know I'm the Messiah, now let me tell you about the Messiah. And he proceeds to make these passion, what we call passion predictions where he tells them what's going to happen to him. The suffering that he will endure. This passage does not explain how or why the death of Jesus lies at the heart of God's divine plan. It simply insists that it does lay at the heart, lie at the heart of God's divine plan. The suffering and death, the passion of Jesus Christ, is part of the divine plan. I, by the way, uh, uh, think I understand why it's at the heart of the divine plan, but that's another sermon. Um, in this text, in this text, it, uh, it doesn't explain why that is. It doesn't explain how it is. It just insists that it is. The shock of this insight has been, per, uh, uh, has been uh, uh, built up to this point um, in the depiction of Jesus in the Gospels. I mean, think about this. Uh, every reader of the Gospel knows that Jesus, by this point, can control all of the forces of nature. At this point, we have seen Jesus heal the sick. We've seen him cast out demons. We have seen him take on the forces of nature themselves. Jesus can command the storm to be still and the waves to abate. He has that power. We've seen it, and every reader up through this point has. So how can this Jesus now permit the enemies of Christ who wish to destroy him to be successful. Certainly, this guy has the power to stop it. If he, can, if he can heal the sick, if he can raise the dead, if he can command nature itself to obey his every word, how can he allow the enemies of Christ to do to him what they had just done to John the Baptist? How can this happen? This makes no sense to the disciples. 
They acknowledge he's the Messiah, and then he makes this prediction that this is what the Messiah must do. It makes it, it doesn't fit their, uh, their, their mindset. It doesn't fit their paradigm. So much so that Peter has to, has to rebuke Jesus. And in some sense, I, I laugh in trying to think about what, uh, if, if we were eyewitnesses there to actually hear the nature of the conversation of Jesus, of, of, of Jesus and Peter, where Jesus has just now made this passion prediction about him having to suffer and die, and Peter takes him aside and says, No, Jesus, yes, you're the Messiah, but you got the role of the Messiah wrong. Listen to me. I know what the role of the Messiah is, Peter is saying. I'm telling you, you're wrong, Jesus. And it's, uh, for, uh, for 21st century ears, that must sound comical for us to think of Peter rebuking Jesus, telling him, no, 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 you're the Messiah. You're going to sit on the throne in Jerusalem, or you're going to summon the angels of light to come down and, and, and fight the demons of darkness in the great apocalyptic battle. But the last thing you're going to do is suffer and die. You're the Messiah, after all. Paul was perhaps right, the Apostle Paul was right when he insists that the gospel of the cross, which Jesus is saying anyone who follows him must take up the cross, the gospel of the cross makes a mockery of all of our human conceptions of success. Peter doesn't get it. And who can blame him? Who can blame him? Confronted with the necessity of suffering, most people react exactly like Peter. We would. I'll bet you we would. I'll bet you we would if we were in the same circumstances. The necessity of suffering is not simply a pious desire to imitate Jesus when he tells us to take up the cross. Much of what is truly worthwhile can only be accomplished by those who are willing to trust Jesus' words that suffering belongs to God's divine plan. Maybe we can't understand why. I mean, I tend to think that the reason we have to suffer is that the world is full of suffering. And if you're going to do anything to help the world, to heal the world, you have to hurl yourself into that suffering. How can we expect anything from the Messiah? But again, like I said, that's another sermon. Notice how I'm working it into this one. We, my Christian friends, have nearly an, a nearly impossible task of understanding suffering as part of God's divine plan. We live in a world where uh, we do everything we can to alleviate our own personal suffering. If we have a headache, we're going to take a Tylenol, we're going to take an aspirin, we're going to take an ibuprofen, simply because we don't want to hurt. Not only do we not want to hurt, we want to make ourselves as comfortable as possible. Maybe it helps us sleep at night to take a sleeping aid. Or, you know, maybe we look at ourselves in the mirror and decide, you know, I've got to lose some weight. Uh, so uh, instead of, of diet and exercise, which is the disciplined thing to do, we, we try to find the, uh, we, we find appealing the ads on television uh, for uh, certain pills that uh, you just swallow these and suddenly the fat melts away. Um, I want to know where it goes when it melts away, my Christian friends, and, and what it melts into. Uh, but uh, we, we live in what I refer to as a, um, uh, a painkiller society. We live in a painkiller culture. We do what we... And, and I'm not saying it's wrong to want to alleviate suffering. I'm simply saying that, that this is the world that we live in. We live in a world where we expect that we can just take a pill and make things better for us. That said, you can see why it is difficult for us to understand why suffering is necessary. When Jesus tells his disciples, this is part of the divine plan, that the world cannot be healed apart from the suffering of the Son of God. In a painkiller culture, a balanced understanding of suffering is difficult to achieve. Jesus sets out the challenge for us to think as God thinks, if we can dare think divine thoughts. He challenges, he challenges Peter 
saying, you know, when you, when you rebuke me, Peter, you're not thinking like God's thinking. You're thinking like people think. And how do people think? They think like Satan. Basically, Jesus is saying to him. As soon as Peter rebukes him, what does Jesus say? This is a fascinating statement. It really is. He says, get behind me, Satan. He says this to the face of Peter the Apostle. Get behind me, Satan. In Greek, it's opiso mu satana. Opiso mu satana. Get behind me, Satan. That is an interesting phrase, opisomu. It actually, believe it or not, occurs twice in this very same passage, though you miss it in English. It, it occurs here when he's telling Peter, who's thinking like Satan, thinking like a human, don't think like a human, get in line, get behind me, opisomu. He says it in the very next verse, in the very next verse, he will say this. If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. Opisomu. What is happening is Jesus is saying to Peter, get in line. Don't think like Satan. Get behind me. Follow me. Don't stand in front of me standing in my way. Don't rebuke me. I know, Jesus is saying, what has to happen. The world is not going to heal itself. We have to go through hell to make the world a better place. And it requires sacrifice on our part, Jesus is saying. And if you want to be a part of this kingdom of God, if you want to do so, you've got to follow me and to follow me, to get behind me, to get in line, Opisomu, you have to take up your cross too. Jesus is being hyperbolic about them taking up their cross. Maybe, maybe not. In some cases, some of the disciples may have faced crucifixion. But everyone faces a little crucifixion if they are doing the work of God in following Jesus Christ. Every single one of us, if we're doing it right. And it's hard for us in a painkiller culture to... Uh, to uh, arrive at some balanced understanding of how we live our lives. Sure, I want to alleviate pain. Jesus wants to alleviate pain. Jesus' healing miracles and his compassion for the crowds in earlier chapters indicates that, that uh, he believes that, that uh, pain and suffering should be addressed. God, when, he, when it's part of the divine plan for Jesus Christ to suffer for the sins of the world, it's not because God is some kind of sadistic deity... It's not because God somehow or other takes pleasure in malevolence. We know that Jesus Christ cares for the sufferings of the world. He, in chapter 6, we saw that he had compassion for the people because they were like lost sheep. We saw Jesus reaching out uh, in, in the, the pain and suffering of Jairus and the loss of his daughter. He raises Jairus, Jairus' daughter. We see that, that Jesus feeds the hungry 5,000. He cares. Jesus cares. God cares about our plight. He cares about our suffering. We even know that he commands the disciples to do the same thing. The disciples go out in Mark's gospel to heal the sick, to cast out demons. God cares for our suffering. And yet danger lies in concluding that the suffering and self-sacrifice are always undesirable. I mean, it's true, my Christian friends, that, that Satan, or the source of evil, might decide to use our pain and suffering to bend our will toward malevolence. That's always the case. Evil people will, will threaten to hurt you in order to accomplish a nefarious purpose. We know that, but just because people use pain and suffering for their ill-gotten gain, for evil, doesn't mean that the pain itself is evil. Jesus is not participating in evil. He's not on the side of Satan simply because he decides he's going to engage in suffering for the sins of the world. 
Suffering is not evil. Evil may use suffering for its tool. But suffering is what we must go through in love for others, as God loves this world, as Christ cares for others. We often pray, my Christian friends, that God will relieve us from the trials of the day. Deliver us not into uh, our temptations. Deliver us from evil. We pray to God to remove the pressures of life. We do it often. I, mean, I, I dare say every single one of us has, has been in a difficult place in life where we have prayed to God to, uh, to deliver us from this suffering. And there's nothing wrong with praying that. But sometimes, and, 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 and often, by the way, if it doesn't work, what do we do? We tell ourselves, we just got to pray harder. We just got to pray harder uh, that God will deliver us from this suffering. But how often do we pray instead that God give us the strength to endure? Sometimes we simply have to go through fire. Somehow, we devout Christians have grasped Jesus as the miracle worker. We have grasped Jesus of the miracles, but we seem to ignore the Jesus of the cross. Prayer is important, and our commitment to the world is important. But prayer is just an opening up of ourselves to what God wants us to do. Sometimes, my Christian friends, to help others means you have to take on their burden as well. And that's painful to do. It's sometimes hard to visit someone in a, uh, when, when we see them in the hospital because we know they're suffering. It's sometimes hard to visit someone in hospice because we know they're dying. To be there, though, and why does it hurt so much? Because it reminds us of our own suffering, of our own mortality. But isn't that what love is? Taking on that pain for the sake of others. Isn't that how we heal the world? Isn't that how Christ heals this sinful and broken world? By taking on the sins of the world upon himself for our salvation. He is truly the sign of what the kingdom of God looks like this side of heaven. So I charge you, my Christian friends, let's not be quick to rebuke Jesus or to rebuke those who are willing to take up the cross and suffer for the sake of others. Let us also be willing to take up the cross if we're called to do so, if we're willing to put ourselves out there and take on the pains of others to make this a better world. To do so is Christ-like. To do so is a sign of the kingdom of God. Nothing wrong, my Christian friends, with praying that God take pain away from us. But with that, let's also remember to say, not my will, but thine. God, give me the strength to endure when the pain will not go away. Help me to walk the path of Jesus Christ. Amen, and may God bless this witness to the glory of his name.